During the Worlds, I think we had six or seven tow planes going, which was quite cool. And massive campsite, um, cabins to stay in, uh, big kitchen, big bar, three huge hangars for all their aircraft. And even during the first day, I came back from the task with my personal best speed, or like every speed on task, it was 129. Cornelia Scheich uh, from Germany, she won the day and she hit for 134. It was really incredible weather. This is Soaring the Sky, a Glider Pilots podcast, coming to you from the Mid-Atlantic region here in the United States and bringing you great soaring content from glider pilots all over the globe. We now join Chuck and our guest pilot. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast today. We have an incredible episode lined up for you. We will first be joining photographer and videographer and glider pilot Georgia Schofield from New Zealand. We're going to hear all about her gliding adventures, soaring all over the world, recently visiting several glider ports in the past several weeks. George has also already competed in a couple national competitions where she has placed first and second. She also has had the incredible opportunity to soar the face of Mount Cook. Now, that's the highest mountain in New Zealand. Georgia also just finished up helping at the Women's Worlds as a photographer and videographer. And we have already shared some of her work on social media, if you want to check that out. Soaring the Sky podcast, Facebook and Instagram as well. Later on this episode, we will be jumping in the cockpit with our good friend Barbara Morovkova and experience soaring in the 2022 Women's Worlds as she shares her flights. Find out how she and her team did there. Also on this episode, Sergio, the Soaring Master, is going to bring us another informative segment. And this one is very appropriate for this episode, being about flying gaggles in competitions. But first, let's join Georgia right now for episode 126 of Soaring the Sky. Georgia, welcome to Soaring the Sky. Hey, great to be here. And you are from New Zealand, correct? Yeah, my home gliding club is Auckland, New Zealand, which is in the North Island. Well, I am excited to hear your story and how you got into sailplanes, so we're looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, well, I uh, grew up across the fence from my local gliding club. Um, My dad was a pilot and he was one of the original members of Auckland. And so I flew a little bit when I was a kid, my first time ever flying. He took me up when I was 10 years old on my 10th birthday. And I was pretty inspired and I spent all my weekends uh, running wings and driving the tractor and hanging around at the gliding club and uh, by about 12 or 13 I was keen to start learning to fly and dad has since told me that this was a joke but uh, he proceeded to tell me how expensive gliding club memberships were and uh, (laughs) back home I think it was about a thousand dollars and I'd have to pay twenty dollars every time I wanted a winch or sixty every time I wanted a toe and proceeded to tell me all about the money side of things and uh that dissuaded me and I ended up going sailing instead and so uh, yeah I just when you're a kid you don't really uh click onto those things too good but uh I was pretty busy with sport through my teenage years with sailing and uh competed at quite a high level in the youth um side of that and uh Then I've been living overseas for a wee while and I just returned home before COVID happened, luckily enough for me. And um, in December 2020, Dad was like, well, do you still want to learn? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so we did a week-long course and after that I went solo and haven't really looked back. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. After four hours and 11 minutes worth of flying, I went solo, which I thought was pretty cool. Oh, yeah, that's pretty impressive. So as far as sailing and soaring, how did it help you in the soaring? Yeah, well, gliding is three-dimensional sailing, really. And it's helping me more and more now that I've started to do competitions because there's a lot of crossover between regattas and competition flying. But yeah, it's uh, really about your mindset and shrugging off your last race and resetting for the next one and being able to make new decisions quite quickly and just, yeah, you're at the 
beg a mercy of the weather. So you really just have to make the best of the day, no matter what it is. And what are you flying most of the time right now? I'm flying mostly a PW5, 13 and a half metre. It was the world's class for a wee while. Um, so then not so popular anymore but we have quite a few of them out in New Zealand and it's a good kind of first uh, single seat glider and we have a class called sports class in New Zealand which is sort of your 13 and a half meter gliders and anything too old to fly in club class which like the K6E or the I think there was a K8 or something in our field as well. So what's the glide ratio on that? What would you maybe compare it to? You got me here. I think it's a 34. Okay. 34 to yeah. one, something like that. Um, it's got a handicap of 81 on the BGA handicap ratings. Okay. Yeah, that gives me an idea. No, I wasn't I wasn't uh, real familiar with that aircraft. So you've yeah. been doing a lot of traveling lately. I mean, a lot. <laughs> when I was talking to you earlier because I, I knew you were coming to the United States what was your plan as far as traveling had are you were you just vacationing or you're working well I'm a sailing photographer um, and I do a lot of other water sports as well and um, I used to live and work in Thailand so I've got a lot of friends over there so when New Zealand decided to open up its borders I uh, was like well it's winter time can't fly anymore let's jump on a plane and get going. Uh, so I went over there to Thailand for a, a week or so and, and spent some time with some friends and ended up doing a bunch of work with them. And uh, then after that, I've been bouncing around Europe, um, doing a lot of different stand-up paddleboard racing events and sailing events. Um, and uh, I had a client fly me to the Yukon, Canada. Oh, nice to do the Yukon River Quest, which was pretty oh, wow. amazing, sort of three-day paddling race um, that we shot a documentary about. And then after that, um, my friends just dropped me off in uh, Hood River, Oregon, on my way home, uh, or my way down south, sorry, on their way home. And I hung out there for a wee while, and I visited the uh, Hood River Soaring Club, which was quite cool. They've got a really awesome club there uh nestled up on the top of the hills um and you can see mount hood from there and there's it's a very windy location so there's an amazing amount of wave up there oh so they're they're doing a lot of ridge and wave soaring or i think a bit of both yeah okay, and they've nice. got some yeah. good thermic days as well there's a lot of paragliders in that area too oh wow and a beautiful part of the country yeah, absolutely. So it was, I didn't get to fly with them because I was a bit busy on the water, but uh, they're really welcoming and they've got a good little setup up there. It was quite cool. And then you made your way south, right? Yeah, I uh, got down to Los Angeles. I've got a good friend who lives there, my best friend, and went and stayed with her and decided to rent a van and drive around a few, what I thought was going to be driving around some gliding clubs, but I... Uh, quickly learned in the US that it's not so much club base, it's more gliding schools and commercial operations. It's a little hard to get in and fly with gliding clubs over there. So you were able to stop at Crystal? Yeah, when I met Chris and Julie at Soaring Academy, they were super welcoming. It was great. I kind of was going back and forth about when I would be able to arrive there. But basically within like half an hour of me arriving at the airfield, um, they had put me in a DG505, I think it was, um, and we were up flying. It was pretty fantastic. Yeah, they, they have an amazing fleet there, and, yeah, really great, great bunch of people. Their crew is awesome, and it's yeah. beautiful flying up there in the San Gabriel Mountains. Absolutely. It was, um, well, probably only my second experience with a commercial operation. The The first time I've ever flown with a commercial uh, pilot was in Omarama with Milan at Kahu Soaring. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah. but then, yeah, I went up with, um, I went up on two different flights at Soaring Academy. First one with, was with Mike and the second one with Jim. And they're both amazing pilots. And, and Jim really kind of did some instructional flying with me and, we sort of started working on my mountain skills and how to recognize different parts of the ridge there and how to be safe in the mountains. 
how was the day did you did you get some good height yeah we got up to almost nine thousand um oh, nice. Yeah, I, oh, sorry, almost 10,000, so high 9,000s. But uh, I decided that I wanted to try, do a little bit of a tiki tour. So I didn't stay and climb all the way to cloud base. We kept kind of moving along quite quickly. Right. So we did a small triangle there, sort of hour 40 flight. So not too long, but enough to start to get a feel for the area. Uh, it, it was really cool. So you made your way to the women's world. Now, was that right after Los Angeles? Yeah, well, um, I was lucky enough when I uh, left Crystal Air, um, they recommended for me to go to two other places while I was around. So I actually got to go up to Skylark North in uh, Tehachapi. Oh, nice. Which was amazing. I flew with uh, Dan Gudgel up there in a Schweitzer 233. Oh, very um, cool. Which was an entirely new experience for me uh, with yeah. the front skid. <laughs> but um, yeah, Jane, who runs uh, Skylark North up there, has such an amazing setup and they have a whole bunch of really cool aircraft and another section of mountains that are super fun to play with. And then, uh, yeah, the day afterwards, I drove down to Warner Springs. Oh, very cool. Which was also awesome down there. And yeah, actually, uh, the second I landed from my flight there, um, the lady who runs the uh, gliding school there, she was like, oh, a couple of Australians just flew in. Do you know uh, Andy Maddox and Claire Scudder? And I'm like, sounds familiar. And um, Andy is the Shemp Hearth dealer from out in Australia. Oh, wow. Okay. And Claire was uh, one of the Australian pilots um, from the World Championships. And wow. she's a top top glider pilot herself and so it was really cool meeting them knowing I was going to the women's worlds because they're quite tight with a lot of the um the British crew over in the UK okay yeah so they were like gave me a bunch of advice with people to go see when I was over here and um yeah they were really lovely and uh actually I think a whole bunch of people here in the UK are flying out to their wedding coming up (laughs) Oh, very cool. Wow. Nice. Which is nice. But uh, yeah, so after that, I um, I came over to, uh, flew into Birmingham. So at the start of this year, I had actually emailed the competition director, Liz Sparrow, and said, I'd like to come and volunteer. And she, I've since learned, she looked at my Instagram and was like, oh, we're on to a winner here. Um, <laughs> and uh, gonna so put her work. <laughs> yeah and so that was a bit of it um one of the local crew picked me up from the airport and drove me to the gliding club and uh in the last three weeks i think i've only spent a total of 12 hours outside of gliding clubs oh wow um so yeah it, it's it was a small um township called husband's Bosworth, which is sort of somewhere between london and birmingham a little bit closer to birmingham Okay, and it's quite a big center. I have a really large runway there, like tons of space um, uh, in terms of width as well, so that the tug planes could be landing right next to the grid and then taxiing back up to launch the next pilot. Um, during the worlds, so I think we had six or seven tow planes going, which was quite cool. And yeah, they had massive campsites. Um, cabins to stay in, uh, big kitchen, big bar, uh, three huge hangars for all their aircraft. And uh, yeah, it was a really cool site. So strictly aero tow then for the competition? For the competition, yes. Uh, okay. But because uh, they needed dr- different drop zones for okay. each of the classes. But they have a sky launch there as well. They do winch launching from. Okay, yeah. So they put you to work. So what was your role? Um, when I arrived, I thought my role was sort of taking some photos, helping out with social media, but, uh, it quickly escalated. Um, I started making videos from every day that we were flying, um, uh, starting with the practice days. Um, so we did little Instagram reels and, and YouTube videos every single day. Um, we'd make a Facebook album of photos. We would be 
tweeting every day, putting up TikToks, uh, and then do a website um, news wrap of the day, and then send out a newsletter. So wow. we were quite busy. Yeah, yeah, you were busy. <laughs> I was uh, really glad to have the help of Amelia, uh, Amelia the glider pilot, there with me. She oh, that's great. was, yeah, she was the face of a lot of the videos, which was quite cool um, and awesome to see her fly. She she got up with one of the local instructors there and went and did some aerobatics for us, which was awesome. Oh, very cool. Yeah, she has so much enthusiasm for the gliding world, well, for aviation in general. It's it's great. Yeah, absolutely. You can just see how driven she is, and uh, she's going to end up doing something pretty amazing. That's for sure. I agree, absolutely. So you have uh, social media. I will put in the show notes, and uh, they can check that out. I, I've seen some of the pictures. It's, you do a great job. Yeah, yeah. So at the Women's Worlds, our social media tag was at WWGC twenty twenty two. And that's pretty much on every platform that you can think of. And so all the social media from the event got put up on that platform. Um, and then myself, I'm at Georgia S Photo. I put a little bit of my gliding stuff up on there, um, but mostly it's my sailing and other work. But um, I've been lucky enough to have some really cool flights out home in New Zealand with some pretty cool people. Um, I mentioned before I got to fly on Omarima with Milan, who runs Kahu Soaring down there. Can you tell us a little bit about those, some of those flights? Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of just messaged Milan uh, saying I was down in Queenstown at the time, um, and I hitched a lift with another pilot driving up to Omarima, and we, we just hit it off and started talking about photography a lot because he's also a photographer and it, yeah then we went up for a, a really cool local flight um end of day a little bit of wave uh which was awesome and then I came back two weeks later and he made me launch into a blue sky and uh we proceeded to struggle for the next two and a half hours including uh me throwing up um oh no but- <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I had a Ziploc bag, and once I had done that, I was perfectly fine, and we ended up all the way up to Mount Cook. Now, how far is Mount Cook from the original launch? Then? I think it's about 100 and, 150 or so kilometers. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah uh, but it's the tallest mountain in New Zealand, and it's quite spectacular. And all the mountain ranges kind of tend to lead to Mount Cook. And that's one of the most beautiful flights you can possibly do. Um, And, yeah, we ended up spending four and a half hours up there. Of course, Milan was wearing a T-shirt. So that's how you know you're guaranteed to getting into wave. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And, yeah, he was absolute pleasure to fly with. And, like, after that, I'd be confident flying with him on – any day, even if it's blue, because he just knew exactly where to go and find the lift. It was uh, quite eye-opening to fly with someone who's that knowledgeable about a place. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And luckily on my, on my drive home, I also stopped in uh, Canterbury Gliding Club and was lucky enough to go for a fly with Terry Delore uh, in his Ash 25. Well, you've been kind of hitting the lottery around the world when it comes to <laughs> soaring <laughs> yeah it's uh, it was pretty lucky um he, he showed me around uh springfield and the, and the local mountains there which was another amazing adventure and um actually a couple months later when he did his uh flight of new zealand with his daughter abby delore um I connected with them on the second flight and I was the photographer who was in the RV-12 motoring up with them. Oh, very cool. What do you use to shoot most of the time when you you go up in the air? um, I've got Canon equipment. So I have a 1DX Mark II, which is a little bit big. It's a big uh, DSLR. Um, I use that for for that specific flight. but then I've since bought a Canon R5, which is a bit smaller, and it's a mirrorless camera. But um, I'm very cautious about uh, flying with cameras. Um, I know Terry doesn't allow cameras in his 
plane, but uh in in other planes i i only ever take my camera if i'm flying dual because it's that much of a distraction that you it's hard to be really safe if you've got a big camera and i want to get a few more years of experience under my belt before i start doing air photos while flying solo yeah absolutely safety first yeah yeah exactly but it's really fun when you've got somebody else and you're doing ear to ear because you're just chatting the whole time and getting them to set you up for the photo and if you're lucky it's warm but when we're up at Mount Cook it very much was not warm so (laughs) it was open the canopy hole take a bunch of photos really really quickly all right close it um (laughs) (laughs) try to try to stay warm try to do anything to stay warm so what's your goals for the future as far as soaring? I know you have a lot going on with sailing and, and your photography, but where do you want to take it from here? Um, I really enjoy competition flying. Um, I, I got to do a couple of competitions back home just after I got qualified. So I got my qualification at New Year's and in J- January and March, I flew my first two competitions, which I got um, second and then first at which was oh, like nice. really awesome. Yeah. Uh, and my sailing background kind of gives me a lot of advantage for that because I, I, I know how to train and I know how to prepare for a competition. And so for me, that that's really the goal. I am keen to get my 300K in this season and uh, to fly as many competitions as I can and just really get into club class flying and hopefully a few years time, I, I might be able to be lucky enough to fly at the women's uh, worlds myself. I think there's a pretty good chance of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, it's all about building the foundations at the moment and uh, spending time in the sky. Absolutely. Anything you want to add before we say goodbye here? Probably the biggest thing would be to thank my dad, uh, Paul Schofield. Um you know, everyone in the New Zealand gliding community as well, um, but my dad especially. I wouldn't be doing this without, without him. George, it's been great talking to you. You have had a whirlwind of traveling, so I'm sure you're going to be ready to go home and take it easy for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm most definitely looking forward to getting home and uh, getting rated in my club's DG300 and, and spending some time uh, training again. Very cool. We are famous here for uh, getting getting back to our our some of our older guests and getting an update and seeing what they're up to. So we'll definitely be checking back with you. We're going to be excited to see where you've gone from there. I did forget to mention something. I, oh, sure. I was I was also one of the first classes of um, Sergio's Soaring Master uh, course. Oh, very cool! Yeah, Sergio, yeah. Be, be excited to hear that we're talking to you yeah i um i did his course in uh december and january of uh last in this year and just as i was leading into my first competitions and his soaring master method is actually something that i use for all of my flights um wow that's just the analysis and the ability to uh track what i'm doing and be as efficient as possible with learning from every flight yeah, we definitely enjoy his segments, and I think they're helpful to a lot of people. And that's just, you know, of course, a small part of of what you're getting with the course. But that is very cool to hear. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, cheers to Sergio. Well, thanks again for joining us. Cheers. All right. Catch up. Bye. Wings and Wheels has been serving the soaring and sport aviation community for over 30 years. They hands down have the largest and most comprehensive inventory of sailplane and soaring supplies in North America and they ship globally. Nearly everything you'll find on their site is in stock and ready for same-day shipping. Wings and Wheels is the exclusive American representative for HPH sailplanes. Be sure to check out the Twin Shark, their latest launch. They're also now the exclusive distributor in North America for the new Just Soaring Glider Sim Pro. The team has thousands of hours of flying experience in gliders and airplanes, staffed by Adam, Kelly, Julie, and Sean. A friendly voice will answer when you call or email them. Check them out at wingsandwheels.com. Barbara, welcome back to Soaring the Sky. So happy you could join us again. Yeah, I'm so happy to to be here once again. It's so amazing to talk to you again about gliding, about what we love. 
So thank you for inviting me once again. Absolutely. It has been uh, quite a busy ride for you here lately, so we're going to get into that. But you just completed Soaring at the Women's World. How exciting is that? Oh, my God. Um, I still haven't really processed every... Um, like all the all the memories and experiences I've I I had there, so it's a bit strange to talk about it because it seems like it it was so so long time ago, but still like yesterday. So um, I was so excited to to go there because uh, it was something that that I was actually working towards to the whole year, and I felt well prepared. Not really for the English weather, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I felt like I felt like um, it's it's gonna be real fun, and it actually was really great experience to have because the weather really wasn't something something easy to to cope with. It was so hard to actually think uh, about the development of the weather during the day. Uh, we flew under like full cloud cover a few times, and yeah, it was it was really amazing experience, and the organization was really well done. Uh, Liz Sparrow, who was the competition director, and who is actually really experienced pilot speaking about competitions, she did really well, and uh, I think that they did amazing job speaking about promotion of gliding uh, on social media because this is something that they worked towards to quite a lot. It was a great experience. Yeah, I know Liz is used, usually uh, in the air, but, you know, she kind of sacrificed that this time and, well, was the director of the competition. But that in itself, you know, taking that sacrifice. But I heard so many great things. She did such a great job, got everybody in the right areas they should be and people that volunteered their expertise you know took advantage of that and it turned out really well yes well she really did amazing job so thank you Liz if you're listening to this podcast once again because we we all appreciated her attitude as she was all smiles even when the situation wasn't really easy to cope with there was no no accident like accident or incident uh speaking about safety so she did quite a lot she took the sacrifice and um i i believe that she was really struggling to not to to be sad about not flying but uh as the, the only the first day was was something that we haven't really experienced even in australia but the other days were really specifically uh english weather tasks so only the first day was something that she she must have been really sad about now what happened that first day well, uh, during the training period, we experienced something that the Brits haven't really experienced in a really, really long time. Uh, we flew almost in the in the blue thermals days. Uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, some cumulus clouds appeared. Really, really high bases, strong thermals. It was uh, incredible for for English uh, weather because, as I spoke during the juniors. I spoke with uh, UK guys and they told me, oh, you will fly in uh, distance days, most of the most of the tasks. You won't really get higher than uh, two or three thousand feet. And it will be so weak that you will probably dump all the water all the time. Oh, wow. And uh, it was something that we really haven't experienced. We, we didn't really experience during the training period. It was strong weather. And even during the first day, I came back from the task with my personal best speed, uh, like average speed on task. It was 129. Cornelia Scheich uh, from Germany, she won the day and she hit well, 134. Oh, it was wow. really incredible weather. Uh, we flew AAT T task three and a half hours in standard class. And we flew uh, almost to the top sailing uh, that was allowed in the UK. 10,000 feet and really, really strong thermals uh, at the end of the day or at the at the end of the task flew under a cloud and that was five, five meter thermal for sure. Wow. It was something I haven't really experienced in Austria, even in Australia. So wow, it was, very nice. It was so great. Yes. And everybody, everybody at the airfield after the task, we were like all smiles and laughing right. because... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> the emotions were real because some, this was something that nobody expected to uh, experience in the UK. So it was so amazing. The first day was great. Yeah. <laughs> what a start. Yeah, I was going to say the difference between the UK and Australia because you were in the last woman's world must have been huge. But then you're telling me the story. I'm like, OK, that's interesting. <laughs> I didn't expect to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it was it was something that we agreed on that this is this is some kind of a weather that we haven't really experienced in Australia. But uh, I think that we were quite unlucky uh, at that time because uh, there were the huge fires and yeah. um uh, the season was really affected by by all those uh, all those like problems like real problems so i'm glad that australia is now like better and even after the floods i think that uh, they're coping really well and um yeah their summer season is ahead so they will probably show us the australian weather c can really strike hot so <laughs> yeah yeah we have to check them up Net, were you in your LSA? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was playing LSA during the Worlds again, but not uh, Echo Uniform as usually. Okay. But uh, I switched to Juliet Bravo, uh, which is usually called Jim Beam. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you flew another LSA, obviously, because it was much easier than to get your LSA there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I flew another one um, as I was actually a team captain in Lithuania. Uh, I just took the Juliet Bravo LS8 uh, with me and uh, I went to Slovakia for some training flights uh, before before the world and actually before another uh, team captain experience for uh, Slovak juniors. I was also a team captain for, for Slovaks during the, the, the junior world in Czech Republic just for a while before I went to the UK. So I had I had like few few nice flights with Juliet Bravo before before I went to the worlds. Uh, it wasn't that big difference, but uh, the pilot who usually flies Juliet Bravo has it really well balanced. Speaking about the weight, okay, so nice. I had like no no big big job to do. Uh, speaking about the preparations, so it was really great. Oh, very nice. Okay, so how did the rest of the days turn out there? I know you had some days that you weren't able to fly, but... Well, yeah, other days were pretty tough <laughs> uh, during the world. Uh, the UK weather st uh, stroke hard. And a um, few days we flew like under really full cover of clouds. And actually, there were a few days that I was really thinking that I didn't know in what conditions we actually flew because... It was so hard to to predict what the weather will do, so sometimes we we did a quite quite a big big um, like mistake that uh, we went to the start line too early because we thought that the weather will get more and more complicated. But actually, we were unlucky, and those two times we did that, it didn't really help much <laughs> because everybody reached us. So. For me, it was really hard to read what the weather will do, but actually, we we had quite quite reasonable days uh, of flying, and I think that we flew like eight eight tasks total. Okay. Club class did like two tasks less because um, there were pretty short windows to get launched and to to fly the tasks. So the uh, so Liz actually decided to keep club class on ground because they were the most numerous numerous class i think that one of uh, that that uh there were like two or three days that were really interesting speaking about the results because the the like total results switched completely i don't know probably twice or three times during the competition so it was pretty interesting during the first period we actually within the czech team in standard class we actually thought oh my god we have to do something about it because we don't want to to be the last ones right mm. and uh luckily <laughs> luckily luckily we we um uh we went for the luck uh during the the next uh next part of the championships and we uh brought uh another medals back home so it is really great 
well it, it was it was a huge year for Czech Czech gliding because we got a medal or more than one medal from each of the international competition that was held this year. So it was a really amazing experience to be part of the team. That's pretty impressive. Congratulations. Yeah, I just don't want to don't want to show off or something, but I I'm just really happy. <laughs> I'm uh, just really be... happy about it. Yes. Yeah, it it took quite quite a long time. Yeah. <laughs> You've earned the right you can show off a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, last so... day things really got moved around. I mean, as far as the places that yeah. that was pretty crazy. Of course, I know that can be common in a competition, but yeah. There, there were some places there that really switched around. And yeah. you yourself was so close to the podium as far yeah. as things go. <laughs> I, missed oh. the, I missed the podium by one, one point. And yes. I was actually, because I was curious uh, by, by what um, time I actually missed the podium. So maybe it was half or one second, something like that. Uh, you can't get any yeah, closer so than that. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I'm happy. But, but I'm happy that uh, it was actually my teammate who who stood to the podium. So it was a win for me either way. So it was good. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, great job, Barbara. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully, more to come. Yes, I think so. I no no doubt in my mind. What were some of the most interesting flights there at the Worlds? Well, I think that. There were like three three days I remember quite well. Uh, one day, that was the first day, because, uh, yeah, it was insane what we flew. <laughs> it was so great, uh, amazing conditions. And it was actually interesting to think about all the airspaces uh, in the UK when uh, the cloud bases were this high, because most of the airspaces around uh, Hasbos are... I don't know, for example, 4,500 feet uh, high. So yeah, it was quite quite a big uh, big management speaking about the airspace when uh, when we flew from the like free space uh, where we could fly up to flight level 100. and uh, we we had to actually get below flight level 65 because of the airspaces over there because of the all the international wow. uh, airports around. So um, that right. was quite interesting. It was something I haven't really experienced uh, before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the second flight. It was really, for all of us, uh, it was battling for staying airborne before the start line. And yeah, it was, <laughs> we dumped all the water so it was basically what all the UK guys said to me before the com. Yeah, we dumped right. all the water. And uh, we also had this PEV start. And so so it was really hard to manage because the cloud bases were uh, like seven, seven, uh, 700 meters AGL. And uh, wow. we had to calculate with the PEV start where you have to wait a certain time before you can actually go to the start line. So this was actually quite hard to manage. <laughs> so you're getting launched and then you're having a hard time staying in the air just to wait till yeah. you get started. Yeah, it was it was really, really hard. Uh, we struggled, I don't know how many times, but about a few times I really tried to save myself uh, from two, 200 meters AGL. Wow. Uh, just to stay airborne. So and wow. and I wasn't the only one. It was it was everybody within within the competitors. It was really really hard. And uh, somehow we managed to start and uh the the weather looked that somehow is flyable. Like few minutes after after the start line, we we had to save ourselves where uh, like from 100 meters AGL from real outlanding so wow <laughs> was, oh my god that was so hard <laughs> and yeah so adrenaline was was really uh on high level during this flight but uh, we managed to to finish the task and it was actually one of the tasks that uh, helped us uh within the standard class and 80 meter class that we uh, we got higher speaking about the the results like total results 
Right. But it was really, really hard. It wasn't really easy. And unfortunately, my, my sister, uh, my gliding sister, uh, outlanded on that day. So she lost the medal. But um, she coped with that quite well and helped her teammate to, to get the medal at least. Okay, that's but cool. I was really sad for her that she didn't manage. But it wasn't really that easy to, to outland on that day. It was really, really, uh, it was so tough. And it was basically only about the luck on that day. Social media, you know, I was watching different posts and someone had posted a video and out in a paddock or field and there were several gliders just coming in and of course all landing out. But that was actually my video. <laughs> Oh, was actually my video from, <laughs> okay. Yes, it was, it was, I, I thought it was. It was I thought it may be, yeah. but I wasn't sure. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was my video because okay. Georgia, who was in charge of uh, like photo shooting, yep, and social media, uh, she asked me if I could actually send her some some videos or, or photos from the field because it was it was uh, I think second or second or third, maybe second second task. Okay. And uh, that there were like seven gliders at the same field. Wow. And yeah, that's crazy. yeah, it was it <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, that, this is it. <laughs> They're all lining up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, funny funny thing was that we actually uh, like me and my my wing women. Uh, we landed first. Then Claudia Hill uh, joined us uh kinga kinga from polish team uh joined us as well there was uh one french girl from club class and who were the others don't actually remember but yeah we were seven gliders at the same field and <laughs> it was interesting yeah wow. <laughs> but we could actually help each other yeah. and it wasn't that far <laughs> from the airfield so that was fine the last uh, flight i remember the most was actually the last task because uh, we were really close to outlanding as well. And um, mm. we were thermaling in a gaggle. Um, I think it was like two, again, it was pretty low, 250 meters AGL. It was near the wind, uh, wind turbines. Oh, so wow. I was actually yeah. thinking, oh, uh, if, if the like negative zero, which we thermal here, will end, I will probably find myself in the in the wind turbine. So, oh, so yeah. uh, it was it was it was also a, a bit of adrenaline and we had to actually wait for uh, a small sunny window that was approaching because uh, the task was really flown during a cold front above the uh, area. Okay. And so it was like full coverage as well. Uh like again, a uh, full oh, coverage man. of clouds. Wow. And the the final glide was pretty tough because uh there were no more active parts of the the cloud coverage. So it was really hard to find something. And then we found the like negative zero or maybe sometimes positive positive zero, uh which we thermaled. Yeah, we like thought oh my god we have to wait for the small sunny window that is coming towards yeah. us because uh. it was actually some some kind of uh, like assurance because when uh when we arrived to the uk it hadn't been uh raining for one month so the oh ground was goodness. pretty dry wow. and uh wow. once the the sun reached the ground almost immediately some thermals triggered so it was yeah, quite wow. quite good speaking about this, and yeah. uh, we were pretty sure that if we if we manage to actually wait on the on the zero thermal, that uh, probably something will happen when the sun come comes. So we had to like wait, and there were three three girls that had to outland because uh, they were too low. Oh, so tough, they. Yeah. They then didn't get they didn't get the the negative or positive zero, so they had to land. But we were pretty close to it. Finally, we managed to to finish the task, but it was something incredible once again. <laughs> yeah. So from the first day to the last day, wow, that's that's some crazy yeah. flying. It was pretty intra intense competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking about those experiences. Wow. 
So where does Barbara go the rest of the season? Are you is is this it? You gonna take a break and then get ready for next year? Or what are your plans? Uh yeah. Well, the winter always serves like some kind of uh, rest period, rest time period. I usually do some some uh, like preparations for for gliding. Uh, this year I have to actually start to some some job hunting because I actually quit my job in May to be able to to fly for the whole summer. Right. So now I'm, I'm job hunting. I'm actually back at home, so uh, I'm kind of sorting everything out because I haven't been here for for three months almost. Right. So yeah, uh, those usual usual stuff that you have to do once you come home. Probably we will we will do some uh, wave flying in Yeseniki Mountains this year, and maybe some ridge flying in Slovakia. As I'm now I'm now like going to Slovakia from time to time. And yeah, basically that's that's everything. The competition season has already ended for for most of us. So yeah, now the rest rest time and some preparation time before the next season. Well, Barbara, thanks for joining me here again on the podcast. Always great to have you. Always nice talking to you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Anytime. Hi, everyone. Sergio from Surrey Master here. Today we're going to talk about an intrinsic part of competitions, gaggles. Gaggles form whenever gliders share the same thermal. They are part of Surrey sport and they offer a great opportunity for all pilots involved to extract the maximum from the thermal since we can use other gliders climb rate to fine tune our centering. But apart from a normal gaggle over our fields or in the middle of the navigation, competition gaggles are very different. Firstly, because they have a greater concentration of sailplanes over the same spot, be that any thermal or the start line. In competitions, the airspace near the start line uh, becomes crowded with sailplanes before the task starts. Sailplanes from all classes which have already been launched will be thermaling together probably using the closest thermal to the start line. Everyone willing to climb as fast as possible and to position themselves for a competitive start. The concentration of sailplanes in these gaggles can generate multiple lanes distributed in different heights with lots of sailplanes with different climb performances and wing loadings sharing the same thermal. It's not uncommon to see gaggles of three lanes and more than four levels in national competitions. Even though these gaggles can offer a competitive advantage for the star, uh, the increased pilot workload and its impact during the first leg cannot be underestimated, not to mention the increased collision risk. Safe gaggling requires all pilots to follow the basic gaggle etiquette, always join the gaggle from the outside, Never cross it straight to the core, cutting everyone else. Don't force another glider to move suddenly and monitor your speed to avoid stalling or spinning. Keeping an effective lookout in a gaggle requires constant scanning in every direction. In order to increase its safety, the FAI and national soaring federations across the globe have been working to improve flight safety with safety briefings during competitions day-by-day analysis of pilot's logs to identify dangerous situations or conducts, lamps that start lines. These are some of the examples of actions taken in order to increase gaggle safety. But in the end, safety is in our hands up there. And that's why vigilance is essential for everyone's safety. In conditions of four eighths of cloud cover, Pay attention to whatever cloud you approach, because gliders can be hidden from your view in the other end of the cloud. Pay attention to every sailplane near you in a gaggle, and please, do not focus on your panel. In a gaggle, speed must be maintained by observing the sailplane's attitude, the airstream sound, the audio vario is a must, and keep scanning the sky and avoiding dangerous trajectories with others. And always follow the golden rule. 
If a gaggle is becoming too stressful or demanding, leave it. There are other tunnels around the aerodrome for you to remain high and reposition before start. There's no need to increase your workload or to expose yourself to a dangerous gaggle. That's it, guys. I wish you all great flights. And for more tips, follow me on Instagram at SorryMaster or check my website, SorryMaster.com. If you would like to say hi and let us know where you are enjoying the podcast, we would love to hear from you. If you are a glider pilot and want to share your aviation journey, contact us at chuck at soaringthesky.com or send us a message on our website at soaringthesky.com and Chuck will get in touch with you. We hope you join us next time for another soaring adventure here on Soaring the Sky, a glider pilot's podcast. Soaring the Sky is written and produced by Chuck Fulton. Original music for the podcast was written and produced by Kim Spangler. Graphic design for the podcast was created by Zachary Fulton. Voiceover work was done by Michelle Perez.